Thank you for listening to Exoplanetary. We love making the show for you, but we rely on your support to continue. Please consider becoming a monthly patron at patreon.com slash exoplanetary. If you'd like to make a one-time donation, you can do that through PayPal at paypal.me slash exoplanetary. You can find links and more information at our website, exoplanetarymedia.com. Any amount helps, and we are truly grateful for your support. Also, follow us on social media. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash exoplanetary, Instagram at exoplanetary, and on Twitter at exoplanetarypod. Exoplanetary, the adventures of the space fairy Wolverton family far in the future. Brother Dustin, the baby of the Wolverton clan, was sent to ready the Earth for habitation by his masters at Exoplanetary. But all the plans have gone out the window now that he's found love. What of Mother Invention, his android nun cohort? She has her own problems, as we discover on tonight's episode, Keep Your Electric Eye on Me, Babe. Welcome to today's broadcast. This is Mother Invention substituting for Brother Dustin once again. We've run out of prepared material, so I'm not sure what we should talk about. In the months since the warrior women of the forest met with the Justice Dudes from the Ruined City, our efforts to ready the heathens for the gentrification of the planet have been minimal at best. In fact, they're non-existent. Love is in the air, and nearly everyone has paired off with someone and is spending nearly every hour of the day making deep, meaningful eye contact and awkwardly kissing. There has been very little formal sexual education among these wildlings, these lost children of the exodus into the wider solar system, but I think it will only be a matter of weeks before they figure out what feels good and the notion spreads. From there, it's only a matter of time before these spandex-garbed man-children and post-apocalyptic Amazons start producing superhuman offspring. How the effete, brittle-boned humans who were sired off-world will contend with such a reunion is difficult to say. Not all of the couplings are procreative, of course. Brother Dustin has been pursuing his own love connection. uber <laughs> How rare is it to meet a person whose name so completely sums up who they are? Yeah, Dustin's a kind of um, inefficient name, dude. <laughs> what should I change it to? I don't know. You're the one who's good with words. I have to admit, Ubi, when Exoplanetary asked, or rather demanded that I come to the Earth, I was dreading my assignment. I was certain that I'd be dead in hours. What an irony that I would discover the love of my life here. Yeah, you're pretty cool too, dude. <laughs> you're so sweet. I'm so glad that I never took that vow of celibacy. That would have been super awkward. He's not the only one who's enjoying this sudden epidemic of Twitter patron. Brother Kermit, our guide through this wilderness, is now courting a team of four warrior women. They've built him a new hut on the edge of the ruined city and are looking after his many needs, both real and imagined. Why they're doing this is a mystery. My guess is that they're hoping to sacrifice him to some obscure god. No, no, ladies, I'm just one man. These old bones can't handle too much strain. But I didn't say stop. It's mystifying, but they all seem happy, so who cares? Well, I do. All of this romantic distraction means it falls to the android to pick up the slack. Unfortunately, I've had my own distraction these past few months and nobody seems willing to step off their cloud for a moment to talk to me about it. Around the time that we came to the city, I had a malfunction which caused me to see a person who comes and goes at will and can control whether other people can see him or not. He calls himself Dave and he claims to have known me since I was a young human girl. That's impossible. For all of my sophistication, I'm an android, 
a machine. Anyway, Dave is my guest for this broadcast. Hi there, Mother Invention. Nice to join you. So, you vex me. Not the first time I've heard that. This is my first time on the radio. How many people are listening to us right now? Oh, nobody's actually listening to this. I'm just trying to stay busy. Oh. Who are you, and where have you come from? I was born in a year or two, in a place not too far from here. You see, this is why I'm having trouble understanding you. Nothing that you say makes sense. You said that I was once a human woman named Catherine. Now you're telling me that you haven't been born yet. Are you making this up as you go along? Oh, I see. I didn't really understand how my life worked either, until I came across Brother Dustin's book about Kurt Vonnegut, the 20th century author. You read Brother Dustin's monograph? I haven't even done that, and I can read Moby Dick in a picosecond. Yes, and then I looked up Vonnegut's books. There's one called Slaughterhouse Five. Are you familiar? I have a computer brain with room for every book ever written. And read. Picosecond. Okay, but for the listeners, the book deals with a man named Billy Pilgrim who comes unstuck in time. He travels to different points in his own personal history and experiences the events of his life more or less out of order. My situation is the opposite. Time has come unstuck from me. How is that different? It means that rather than traveling through the events of my life and experiencing them out of order, I am unbound by the normal conventions of time and space. How does that work? My mother would send me to play outside when I was very young, and I would discover myself in times and places I'd never heard of. Sometimes I'd accidentally step into danger, like a battlefield in the middle of a cannon volley, and I'd be so startled by what I saw that I would run home a minute before I left and then watch myself run out and disappear. How did you learn to cope with this? I learned all that I could about history. That was very helpful until I was noticed by exoplanetary employees. They traveled into the past and made me an offer I couldn't refuse, to hire me as a free-range troubleshooter. I complied until I learned two very important and troubling things. What did you learn? The first thing that I learned was what Exo had planned for the next hundred years, relatively speaking. These people were from a century in your future, you see, when time travel is more widely available. Oh, of course, yeah. I was about to follow up on that. The second thing I learned was that what they're planning will result in me being erased from history. How did you learn all of this? Paying attention. And this Catherine woman, she's from the more recent past? She died? Yes. I can't tell you about that right now, though. Calvert and Ben Wolverton are about to land about a hundred yards to the east, and they can't see me. Yet. Wait, what? You can't just pop off. I... He's gone again. We're right through here, Ben. This place is amazing. A forest we can simply walk through without paying anyone. And this air. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this was the best part about time traveling. Getting to experience these wide open spaces. Seriously. The future is the pits. And you say that he's somewhere in these woods? Yes, yes. Over there in that clearing. Oh, Ubi. How did I ever get so lucky to find a person like you in this dark and hateful universe? We all meet our proper justice in the end, dude. I know. I just can't believe that I live so right that I deserve a guy like you. You've really become everything to me, Ubi. Everything. Mm. Mm. Ubi. Yes, right over here. Uh, oh, good grief. Uh, <clears throat> what? Oh, oh, my goodness. Calvert? Ben? What on earth are you doing on... Earth. Hello, Dustin. Hello, Dustin's friend in very tight clothing. Who are these dudes, dude? And what primrose path have you been leading my baby brother down, you, you cad? Calvert, please don't. We've seen your kind before, mister. You show up in your extraordinarily tight clothing and say a few pretty words into his shell-like ear and get him to turn his head. And for what? A few empty promises later and you're off. To some other time period and... Wait, what? Uh, what? <clears throat> if you're not going to be honest in your courting and ask for our blessing for the marriage, I'm perfectly willing to thrash you within an inch of your life. He has superhuman powers, Cal. Yes, Ben will thrash you within an inch of your life. Hey, guys, guys, no thrashing. This is Uber Dude, my boyfriend here in the wilderness of the rejuvenated planet Earth. Ubi, these two are my older brothers, Ben and Calvert. Pleased to meet you. 
I'm keeping my eye on you, mister. What are you two doing here? How did you find me? Same way I found Ben. He injected us with monitoring chips while we were sleeping. You what? Hey, it's a big universe. You never know when I might need you. More to the point, why are there so many people on Earth? Our survey detected hundreds just in the immediate area. I always heard the people who stayed behind after the exodus, you know, they, they died. Many did die, but those who survived did so because they're strong and wily. My ancestors were gnarly dudes, yo. Even when things were totally a bummer, they were righteous and took things to the max. Is he speaking English? Clearly you have no experience with post-apocalyptic variations on the mother tongue. You have no idea what he said, do you? No, no, I I, don't. He means that he and the other survivors have had to evolve quickly over the generations since the exodus. There are fewer humans now, so the planet has dealt with many of the ecological horrors that overpopulation inflicted upon it. And now it's populated by those who are strong and can survive. Superhumans. It's amazing. Just what we needed. What do you mean? There's a small and weary band of spider people out there who would like a few muscle-bound humans to help them out. Oh, no, Calvert. That's a terrible idea. What are you guys talking about? Good morning. The madness has only escalated with the arrival of two Wolverton siblings, elder brothers to our brother Dustin. It's fitting then that the morning spiritual broadcast seems to be morphing into a public affairs program, hosted by me, because why not? I have quite a panel with me this morning. Brother Kermit has taken time away from his backwoods harem. Greetings. I'm afraid that I will be deferring all questions about my new status as a sex symbol to my upcoming memoir, Brother Kermit's Guide to the Art of Pleasing Women, Volume 1. There will be 78 tasteful illustrations. Yuck. Joining us will be new arrivals to the planet Earth. First is Ben Wolverton's aide-de-camp and right-hand android Lucy. Good morning, Mother Invention. With this broadcast, Lucy and I will attempt to become the first two female-identified androids to have a conversation that isn't about a human male, thereby passing the Asimov Bechdel test. Looking forward to it. Fight the biopatriarchy! We also have Vladimir, an arachnidian hailing from another galaxy. Since this is an audio medium, I'll describe Vladimir as being roughly five feet tall and having eight limbs that act as hands or feet, depending on his needs with his head in the center. Yes, it's very versatile. We'll we'll start with you. When Ben and Calvert Wolverton arrived here last week, it was part of an effort to aid in a revolution on your world. Yes. Evidently, your exoplanetary corporation sent explorer drones powered by human consciousness to our solar system. One of these overpowered our society and, over several decades, decimated our culture under her totalitarian rule. Yes, the Wolvertons have now press-ganged us into manufacturing a large teleportation device, which will be used to transport a vessel from our solar system to theirs for the purpose of deposing this tyrant. My question is, why? Why is this our problem? That's right. Earth is for Earthlings. I don't see why we want to get involved in this, not our fight. So you want to leave this matter, which is a direct result of human exploration completely unresolved, allow a tyrant to reign unchecked? Wasn't human exploration, though, was it? It was this exoplanetary corporation who'd done the misdeed. Let them fix it. Explain to me, then, how we hold exoplanetary accountable. As a representative of my revolution, I'm attempting to do just that. Thankfully, the Wolverton brothers are willing to get involved on our behalf. Yes, Ben Wolverton has offered up his space shuttle and supplies, including a number of artificial intelligences, who will assist in the operation of the large teleportation arch currently being constructed. Calvert Wolverton is arming Ben's shuttle with defensive weaponry. So, what has Brother Dustin been asked to provide? The oldest and dearest of provisions, blood and treasure. Brother Dustin is going to be asked to provide troops for this little misadventure, and I'll tell him what I'll tell you folks. My library of books rescued from the earlier ages of man is filled with the stuff of war. It is as it ever was. The powerful and the influential, like these Wolvertons, like exoplanetary, pushing those without any information like my friends the Justice Dudes and the warrior women of the forest, into fighting their battles for them, or fixing their mistakes, or even just furthering their ends. 
This naked push for war is just the same old thing, cloaked in the garments of this century. But what if it brings the freedoms that you enjoy to Vladimir's people? Isn't that worth it to help others? Frankly, I'm not at all fond of the tiny spiders we have on this planet. I don't think I'm all that inclined to help their giant cousins. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm told that I may appear creepy and undesirable to the human aesthetic. And yes, it's incredibly dangerous. But you should also know that the Empress, based on the mind of a human being, has a homecoming on her agenda. When Calvert and I were captured, she had us working on technology that would allow her to return to this solar system and conquer you all. If you do nothing now... I see no reason why she might not succeed. Let her come to Earth. We can handle her. No. You can't. You're not ready for her, just as my people weren't. It'll be the end of you all. And on that happy note, I'll close today with this thought. A fool may find a paradise in his delusions, but war is always hell. Have a fine morning. Ah, those are birds, right? Yeah, dude. You've seen birds before. I've read about them. I've seen pictures of them. I've never seen or heard one before I came to the Earth. I never realized I was missing so much. Dude, like, what's it like up there? In the sky? On other planets? Uh, everything's cramped and we eat lousy food. There are places within outdoors. And terraformed regions. But those are for the wealthy and the privileged. I've only visited those places. We were all compressed and compact in our habitats. Recycled air. Do you remember that morning after it rained a few days ago? Yeah. That was the cleanest smelling air I ever inhaled. I was almost dizzy from the feeling. I spent that morning breathing in and out, over and over. The Earth's the most amazing place I've ever been. With the most amazing people. So strong and beautiful. All of you. Oh, man... You're gonna make me blush, dude. My brothers want us to leave all this behind. Go to some other planet nobody's ever heard of. And fight a war? A war! Nobody out there is fighting war, Zuby. Not in our solar system. There hasn't been a war in forever. Not since the days when everyone lived on Earth. And go to war for what? To fix something for exoplanetary? Well, the warrior women don't mind going to war. And us justice dudes, we love to fight the good fight. Truth and justice and something, something. Look, Ubi, having a few bust-ups and knocking over dilapidated buildings is one thing, but I've read about the horrors of war. Whatever you think it might be, it's a thousand times worse. Well, so many of the dudes and dudettes are looking forward to the war. But all they hear about is, you know, what a great war it'll, it'll be from that spider dude and your brother... The talky one. And you want to go to war too? I want to help if I can. But if it's such a bad idea, why haven't you said anything about it? What do you mean? Everyone listens to you, dude. And you haven't said anything about the war except maybe to me. And I'm sitting here and I'm wondering, is he trying to convince me or himself? Right here, right now, before you disappear like a ghost again... Before I feel like I've completely malfunctioned, explain yourself. I'm not broadcasting. It's just you and me. How can I help you? I have no memory of being Catherine. Correct. So, I can't be Catherine. You are her. You even look like her. If you think that it's troubling to you, imagine how odd it is for me, someone who watched you grow up. I need you to tell me everything about her. No, not right now. The thing you have to do is watch for the moment you're needed most. Please, you're taxing my logic circuits. Androids don't have logic circuits. It was a figure of speech. I'm getting tired of being treated like a dumb machine. Your brain is as complicated and beautiful as any human's. When Catherine was dying, the only way to save her was to put her mind, her personality, into an android. I had some help with that. Unfortunately, time can be fluid and your history can be malleable when handled incorrectly. 
So I can't know about my past because it affects the future? That's one way of looking at it. Now keep an eye out and an ear to the ground. Your friend Brother Dustin is about to decisively alter events. And then I can hear the whole truth? The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Hello, everyone. This is Brother Dustin. It's, um, it's been a while. Look, we've all been distracted. It was exciting for all of us to find each other after thinking that we were alone. I mean, after thinking that you were all alone. It must have been exciting to discover someone you love. To find someone to love. It's one of the greatest things in creation. And these times are truly to be cherished. Because they don't last forever. They can be cut short. Just like that. Where I come from, we don't have wars. We haven't had one out there. The values are different. They had to change out there. But here on Earth, there were many. And all those wars have had something in common. Many people died. Too many people. And not just the people who fought, the soldiers, but also people who were just living their ordinary lives. And more than that, the wars. They never really solved anything. All they caused is more hurt. One war bled into another, and into another, and another. I love you all dearly. My leaders, the people of Exoplanetary, sent me here to teach you of our ways up there on the other planets and moons. But you've taught me things that I never really thought were possible. Ways of living connected to this planet. I must confess to you, though. My master sent me here to turn you into their servants for when they return. Now that I say it out loud, I admit to you all, it finally occurs to me how horrible that would have been. I'm ashamed of that. I truly am. I'm ashamed, and I beg your forgiveness. But that's no longer my reason for being here. I want us to find the other people on this beautiful Earth. This is humanity's second chance, and I'm going to use all of the wisdom our ancestors ignored to make the best of this homecoming. And that means that humans are through killing. We're through with violence, all of us. Unless we absolutely must defend ourselves, we can never fight again. There will be no war, my friends. We will have no war. You a lot of nerve to show up here. Don't start, Cal. He only did what he thought was right. You're clever. You'll come up with another way to resolve it. One that doesn't cause so many people to die. And what if I don't? That twisted empress is going to find a way to get here before long. And then what? Then we'll figure out something when it happens, Cal. We have minds for a reason. I understand if you're upset with me, but I also know you can appreciate that we have something pretty amazing here and why we'd be reluctant to give it up. And I think you're mature enough to realize that not all of your little brain donors agree with you. What? These folks might be forced to listen to you, but enough of them are chomping at the bit to join up with the cause that will actually have a respectable force out there. No! Smaller, yes, but serviceable. There will be more casualties, of course. These are human beings, Dusty, not robots. They are programmable to your whims. That's the only thing that separates us from the androids. We still have free will, for better or worse. And to be honest, we only really wanted the volunteers anyway. Well, Lucy tells me that the guidance satellite will be ready for launch in the morning. Once it's up, we'll test it, build some armaments, and be out of your hair. I see. If it's any consolation, Dusty, I'm sorry it had to be this way. If there were any other path, I'd take it. I'm not mad at you. Just disappointed. Dusty, don't go away mad. Let him go, Cal. <laughs> what is this I'm drinking? It's a fermented sort of lactic acid. Uh, it's horrible. <laughs> I'm loving the buzz. I'm glad there are no cars here. They're all celebrating. What? Why? Many of them are going to die. And they will be my people's heroes, Mother Invention. The revolution will produce many martyrs, and that's why we must celebrate today. Look, it's Brother Dustin. He doesn't look very happy. Mother Invention, can I see you for a moment in private? Brother Dustin, I'm sorry that we do not see eye to eyes in this matter. But I respect your views. We will need many men of peace. 
Once the war is over. Oh, come on, Vladimir. I don't think now's the time. Uh, we'll see you both in the morning. What did you want to talk about, Brother Dustin? We have to figure out a way to stop them. Do something to make it so they don't have to go at all. We have to come up with an idea. Brother Dustin, I know that you're upset, but I... I just spoke to Uber Dude. He volunteered. Oh, no. I can't lose him. Not like this mother invention. Not like this. We have time before they ship out. We have to come up with something. I'll do what I can to help. I... I had a feeling that it might be something like this. You did? A little bird told me. We're getting a reading from the satellite. It's good, everyone. Now, for the most important task. We have to test the teleportation arts with a human being. Calvert and I can't go because we need to stay behind to make repairs in case, well, it doesn't work. I'll volunteer. Are you sure, Brother Kermit? We're pretty confident that it'll work, but we can't be completely certain. Three of my four brides have agreed to fight your dirty little war. I would not be able to let them go without doing something to make sure that they can get there and back safely. My conscience wouldn't let me sit still. Well, fine. Do you need help up to the platform? Don't lay your hands on me, you son of a... I can get up there by myself. How is this little fun fair supposed to work, anyway? We program the coordinates from here. The satellite scans you and draws you from the platform through a hole in space and time to your intended destination. Hyperspace, or some sort of quantum wheeze, huh? Exactly. If we were in the spaceship, we'd be able to test that through a much larger hole in space-time, but this needs to be a subtle maneuver to maintain the element of surprise. <laughs> what if I live and some of these spider people take me? Try to stall them. You'll only be standing there about 15 minutes as you experience it. When the arch brings you back, it'll also bring back everything in a five-foot radius. And everyone. Got it. Well, like the man said, I regret that I have but one life to give for my solar system. Now, this is the ingenious part. Vladimir was very familiar with the technology, but we incorporated ideas from my time travel device. This is what allows the arch to safely move living matter. It also allows us to cheat Father Time a bit by bringing him back instantaneously, which we'll do right now. Oh, my, he brought back company. She isn't an arachnidian. See? It only tickles a bit. The only way to fly. Is it true? I'm really on Earth? Who is that woman? I must have sent you to the wrong planet. Not at all, Moan Frere. Through a fluke of luck, you managed to land me right in the middle of the arachnidian liberation front. And this... Space-time travel is quite a rush. I haven't felt this perky since that time. I found all of those coca plants. Woo! Calvert? Is that you? You know my name, but... No. It can't be. After all this time, you don't even recognize me? It can't be. Oh, yes, it can. It's Stacy Curtis. You left me stranded on that planet for 30 years, you clown! You have been listening to Exoplanetary. Keep your electric eye on me, babe. Written by C. Christopher Hart. Performed by... Bobby Eversman as Brother Dustin. Stephanie Leet as Mother Invention. David Loftus as Ben Wolverton. Chloella Brading as Lucy. Danger Marshall as Dave. C. Christopher Hart as Calvert Wolverton. Justin Atkins as Vladimir. Alex Wank as Uber Dude. Katina Andoniades as Stacy Curtis. 
And Bill Carey as Brother Kermit. Produced by C. Christopher Hart. Original music provided by Jacob Jensen. Sound effects by Danger Marshall. This play, the characters, situations, and associated intellectual property, copyright 2015 and 2017 by C. Christopher Hart. All rights reserved. Recorded in the Bigfoot Podcasting Studio, located at Ned Space in sunny Portland, Oregon. The award-winning Willamette Radio Workshop returns for the 19th annual UFO Festival in McMinnville, Oregon. Two live radio shows at the Hotel Oregon in Maddie's room at 3 p.m. Saturday the 19th. Isaac Asimov's Pebble in the Sky and Craig Kenworthy's Herf, the Extra-Dimensional Assassin. Tales of future worlds with a modern edge. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll wonder when the mothership arrives. Free admission with food and beverages available. All ages are welcome. Live radio lives at McMinniman's 19th Annual UFO Festival. (laughs) 